Welcome to Popaholics, the show about hot takes, hotter than pancakes. Hey, for goodness sakes, would you just look at them cakes? This is your first time to the show. Welcome. My name is Christian. I am the host of Popaholics in this messy room, coming to you live for us, not for you. I'm Christian, and I'm joined as always by Chris Conkling oh! and Brian Dupree. <laughs> That's pretty good. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, man, I'm super tired again, coming back for another video episode. Glad we're able to do some of these main topic episodes on video. It's a lot of fun. This week on the Popaholics, this month, actually, we've been talking all about Chadwick Boseman. We covered 42 on last week's episode. And this week, uh, we are covering another a historical reenactment of a famous uh, person in America, starring Chadwick Boseman. Before we get to that, gentlemen, how are you doing today? Doing well. Yeah. Hanging in there. Not as tired as you, I think, but maybe fading fast. We will see. Yeah. No, um, I am not excited for it, but semi waiting for the new Kanye West album to drop tonight. It was supposed to come out two weeks ago. He's got a live stream of basically people in a room with a countdown clock. We'll see if it actually happens, but um, I'm not getting my hopes up for that one. You know, I like that you brought up Kanye West because I feel like we're about to talk about uh, proto Kanye West in, in Yo. quite a few ways. Uh, Interesting. Very excited. He to get is into an it. eccentric. Before we get into it, we do want to remind you that our YouTube watchers out there, you can subscribe to this podcast if you find it's interesting. It really helps us out. Also, the audio feed and all our social media found below in the uh, what's it called again? About description box. Uh, and then for our podcast listeners, uh, you can find a YouTube if you want to see what tired old Christian looks like uh, late at night talking about movies. Head on over to YouTube and subscribe there. So without further ado, uh, you know, I'm super stoked and I've been in a good mood. I've been bumping away ever since uh, I saw this movie. So I'm so excited. We're going to be talking about 2014's Get On Up. You special. Your mama's on no account food. Daddy too. But you ain't gonna be. One day, everybody gonna know your name. James, man. So you wanna be a singer? Oh, no, sir. What I really wanna be? Mechanic. Mm -hmm. You got a problem? You do music? The only thing that keeps me sane in here. He's a showstopper. It's a miracle. Really? Maybe me and you could uh, work on a little harmony together. Clara, get down here. She coming, mama. She coming. Look at these people, James. When is it going to be when we up there? We'll be back in right now. Little double entendre there at the end of the trailer. Yeah, heavy handed. <laughs> For uh, Get On Up, 2014. Something directed. was getting on up. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> directed by Tate Taylor, written by Jez and John Henry Butterworth, scored by Thomas Newman and uh, James Brown. I don't know how he's not, I don't know how James Brown isn't credited for this part. I, I guess because he didn't score the score. I guess that's how that works. But there's a lot of James Brown in this movie. Budget of $30 million. Ooh, and it looks fantastic for a $30 million movie. It grossed $33.4 million, which, as we'll find out from my opinions, I think it's a travesty. Absolutely. And it stars Chadwick Boseman as the titular James Brown. Well, it's called Get On Up. He's not titular, but he's James Brown. This movie's about James Brown. Super tired. Jamarin and Jordan Scott as young James Browns. Nelson Ellis as Bobby Bird. Dan Aykroyd as Ben Bart. Viola Davis as Susie Brown. Lenny James as Joseph Joe Brown. Fred Melman as Sid Nathan, and I do also want to shout out Craig Robinson as uh, Maceo Parker. Uh, what are we going to be talking about? Well, before we get to spoilers, we're going to talk about Chadwick Boseman. Chris did not get a chance on our 42 episode to uh, talk about Chadwick Boseman um, and like the summation of uh, what he thinks about his career, so we want to give him a chance to do so. I would like to talk about our history with James Brown. I'm going to add that in there. I know we're supposed to do that in show notes. I'm sorry, boys. But just our history of James Brown music before walking into this film and our non-spoiler thoughts on the viewing. We'll then jump into spoilers, talk about our standout moments, some spoilers, and get into our final thoughts on the film. 
So let's start. Chris, you did not have a chance to uh, express your feelings about the late Chadwick Boseman. This is in memoriam of him that we are talking about it. That is our theme. We're remembering yeah. him as an actor and revisiting his films or visiting him for the first time. Many of these films this month will be for the first time for us. But Chris, your thoughts on Chadwick Boseman going into this month? Uh, I'm a fan, you know? Um, it's tough to put into words exactly how I feel outside of uh sad man like this was a tragic loss last week you referred to him as like a james dean type and you know while while he was in his 40s um which isn't old by any means and james dean i believe was young even younger than that and anton yelchin you compared him to as well even younger um he's gone too soon man like if anything from watching these movies the one thing that I've taken away from them is that he he was just pure unbridled charisma. Like he seemed like such a good person and such a, a sweet man. Um, it's tragic that people like this have to be taken before their time, you know, and, and just understanding like how he bared uh, the cross of his illness alone. Well, not completely alone, but he wouldn't tell any of his close collaborators about it um honestly like the word saintly kind of comes to mind when i think about uh, the type of person that chadwick boseman was uh toward the end you know he just seemed like a good person especially in like the last the last like i don't know seven eight nine years of his career it seemed like he was specifically choosing roles um to to lift up to lift people up you know, like he, he was very deliberately picking the films that he was working on. Um, and they typically always had a very positive message. And I just really appreciate somebody like that. And I'm very, very sad that I won't get to see him uh, grow and be in more projects. Yeah, I think me and Brian feel the same way. We express some of our thoughts. But yeah, just keep going through this career. It's like, honestly, especially looking at the like gross, it's like, uh, obviously discovered by some, but I think in retrospect, I think a lot of people will look back and go like, wow. Yeah. Uh, what an absolute tour de force of talent. And honestly, like, I want to say this about Black Panther, like him being Black Panther is important, but by no means do I think Black Panther was even one of his best performances. It almost like makes me upset. Not that Black Panther's not great. It's just like... It is good, but compared didn't... to his other work, um, it's not at the top. I can tell you that. So if you're only familiar with Chadwick Boseman through Black Panther, while I love Black Panther and what he's done in the MCU as that character, I highly, highly recommend uh, visiting these films with us because he is so good in all of these movies. But so I definitely, I definitely agree with this, but I think Boseman becoming who he was in civil war and with minimal screen time doing what he did it's hard to think that someone else could have done it and become oh, a definitely, staple definitely as, not. as he did but i totally yeah. agree that he's he's not on display in the way that he is in in these movies brian right. i was gonna say the exact same thing our head was in the exact same space because you know yeah. I'm a big, civil war is one of my favorite marvel movies and i think with what little time he has to literally have he an was a standout story, in that film. origin story and like every scene sells these like super quick dramatic moments that have to happen and have to land yeah. so well. I mean, his whole character is summed up in probably three minutes of screen time, maybe less where he basically meets his father and, you know, it proceeds from there. Uh, but we're talking about get on up today. And uh, I really wasn't expecting a lot from this movie. You know, I really wasn't. I, I know Bozeman is good. We saw 42 and you're just like, he's the best. He him and Harrison Ford are carrying that movie on their backs we've seen black panther and like i what we've talked about and impact there i know i know he's a good actor this for me was it is even like this is a turning point for me of like transformative <sighs> yeah like it's it's hard I, I try not to like look too rosy through it but damn damn if anything i don't know if everybody's gonna love this movie as much as i did but uh if you haven't seen it i'm gonna say this right now you, you have to watch it you have to i paid 15 dollars on iTunes, which I was like, ooh, steep. Like, steep for just, like, a purchase because we have to buy some of these movies. Brian and... even wrote in the show notes that it was streaming on Netflix. 
oh, I'm so mad at my Apple <laughs> TV right now. Literally for no a regret. whole month. I'm so still sorry. Still no regrets that I own it. Okay, for life. good, good. Still yeah. no regrets. Even more so, I'm like, no, I'm still happy. <laughs> I have all those special features. It does have some iTunes. Why I, I don't believe the Apple TV ever says that something's available on Netflix. Oh yeah, they're they're not. Well, I can't speak up. Uh, I'm just but not even going to touch that. Uh, so uh, let's go on as, <laughs> as we're doing this and let's actually move into your gentleman's opinion. I'll share mine in more depth. I just going to say straight up, I love this movie so much, uh, but Brian, let's start with you. So did we want to get into history with James Brown first? Oh yeah. I did change it on you. And then, uh, <laughs> so, okay. So in preface, I love this movie. It probably has to do with how much I love James Brown, but uh, Brian, what's your history with James Brown's music? So I feel like, his music is kind of ubiquitous in the culture. And I didn't always know um, coming into this movie, all of these songs were James Brown, but I had heard so many of these songs. And I'm realizing that one of the first introductions as I'm looking through his songs is Living in America from the Rocky Four soundtrack. It was probably one of the first times where I saw James Brown and knew who he was. Um, uh, Cause I'm not sure if my parents were big. I don't think my parents were big into his music specifically, although I'm sure they knew all of the hits as well. But um, man's world, it's man's man's world. I had definitely heard before. Uh, Get up off that thing. Just an absolute classic. You cannot not dance when listening to this sort of music. So, um, yeah, I think Rocky IV was actually my first introduction to James Brown. And until yesterday, because I listened to the Live at the Apollo after it was brought up in the movie um, in, nice. in Get On Up. And it's amazing. I ended up buying the vinyl as well. But um, I had never listened to a top to bottom James Brown record, and I really regretted it. But now I have all of this music to dive back into, so I am super, super hyped. And, um, yeah, it's a shame that it took me this long to get there. But, um, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Uh, Chris? Yeah, I think uh, ubiquitous is the perfect way to describe James Brown as an artist, Brian, because he's just out there in the zeitgeist. You know, I personally don't really have any type of specific moments uh, where I'm like going through a James Brown fra phrase or anything like that. But I've heard all of these songs just but from being alive in the United <laughs> States, you know, so I'm familiar with his work, but I've never sat down and like you said, listen to a James Brown album from top to bottom. Um, but I am very familiar with his work just because of uh, the exposure, you know, that we get here in the, in the States. Uh, I'm going to try to keep this short because I could have an entire podcast on James Brown, but I'm lucky enough to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the musician on this, um, on the pod, midnight satire, subtle plug to find around book music. Uh, not nearly as good as uh, James Brown or much of anything else, but I uh, have a lot of very talented friends. And one of my friends, Evan Ivanfeld, I'm going to shout him out. I actually played uh, a show with his band, Donna Lou, which Brian, you were at. That was fun amazing show it was good it was a good time and uh, i played in a band with this gentleman he was first chair jazz bassist for his high school very large high school very talented jazz band and he played in my uh in my band in high school and he introduced me to james brown now i had been introduced to james brown through the zeitgeist through the ubiquity of funk uh with harriet the spy because uh, get up on the thing oh is what closes that film as they all dance and they're, uh, they're like in fruit uh, costumes. Wait, what movie? Harriet the Spy. Oh my God, that is right. I totally remember this scene. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. They okay, that might have been that. <laughs> that was one of my earliest get up off well, thing, which you just danced to. You just danced to it. And uh, he was he was absolutely in love with James Brown because it, it, and it's interesting because you know my background I come from very lyrically focused music and James Brown is the complete opposite but in like a, like the best way possible it's um, he's more about the feeling feeling and honestly he revolutionized um, using every instrument as if it was a drum and the effects of the way that James Brown. Uh, or uh, in his band orchestrated music uh, literally created a genre uh, uh james brown invented funk like he invented an entire genre so that that's a kind of like uh it's like once in a generation once in a decade type of influence that you 
create an entire genre of music. He's the godfather of soul. He, he's the hardest working man in America, right? Uh, he literally defined an entire different style of playing music. Uh, and and he's absurd. He's, he's absurd in the way that Kanye West is absurd, which is just his personality shines so through so strong and his talent shines through so strong with the type of style of genre of music that he's making that it defines, it, it redefines what music can be. And we'll get into why I think this film is I'm working. A, Please go ahead, Brian. I'm going to cut in here because um, I'm a big fan um, of J. Cole and uh, I listen to a good amount of hip hop, but J. Cole at some point was talking about the Migos and the way that they do ad libs. And so the, the Migos, for those who don't know, are a very popular modern hip hop group. And he was talking about their ad libs and said, you listen to their ad libs and it's basically James Brown, like the way James Brown sings. And if you go listen to Migos and the way they do ad libs and the style and the punctuation of it, it is inherently like you, you can't not see the comparisons. And um, you know, I'm sure they're very familiar with James Brown as well. But even to this day, people are uh, mimicking and inspired by the styles that that he created. No, like you're absolutely right, and it, it actually affects a lot of modern hip hop because, uh, and even hip hop itself is sort of a is sort of a mutation of funk because the voice is so much less of a melody and so much more of a. Uh, an instrument in the sense of like a string and again more percussive right using the voice percussively and james brown had you know what's interesting is he had the innate ability to sing like the man could sing oh right but he used his voice percussively as did the horn section as he basically said what if everything was a horn and created syncopation right so you're sta like again i i could do a whole podcast on this but your standard beat is like one two three four one two three and james brown was like uh okay we're gonna do we're gonna do emphasis on the one so we're gonna do one two three four one and then let's have the horns come in on the one bum, bum. like come in after the one and then uh, let's have my vocals come in on the on the three and and it, ah, you know and he just shoots in and so what happens is you have that you have the beat which is emphasized right on that one and so you're like you're automatically on your back foot when you're listening to it and i dare you to listen to james brown and not fall on your back foot while you're dancing because it's hitting on the one so hard right and then all the instruments are hitting the in-betweens and it's just a groove the whole thing is a groove and it's a vibe and it's a feeling and it's something and it's it, what it is is funk uh, and uh, and he, then he then he comes out like a like a like a like a black Baptist preacher like a Pentecostal preacher and just starts shouting and he him himself his vocals are also an instrument and uh, it's it's such raw uh, like musical feeling uh, that it's just it can't be understated and and then the man has and you haven't even talked about his dance moves. Oh like, yeah, and the man. This was is a, outside a of his dancer. just straight up straight stage presence right. and performance. <laughs> and he has a, I mean, he has a he has a sixteen minute epic, which is split into two parts that I referenced at the beginning of the episode. And this was uh, Evan's favorite song that he would always be like, "You want to understand James Brown? You only need two songs. It's goodness sakes, just look at them cakes, part one and part two. And it's like sixteen minutes of music, and the like, it's just talking about women's asses." And it's just a groove, and it's just musicians vibing, and it's all the things I just talked about. And it isn't really about what he's saying, right? Because, I mean, everything is very – I mean, there's some things where he's making a statement and stuff like that. And he, he was able to be diverse in some ways in, in some of the music he was making as far as lyrical and what he was speaking about. But at the end of the day, his biggest influence was just he could get anybody up and dancing, right? He basically expressed gospel and soul – and was able, in a similar way to Kanye West, to reach across racial barriers and make anyone dance. Uh, and for that, uh, e everything is uh, everything is affected by it. He, he invented a new way to do the counterpoint, which is exactly what you're saying, which is ad libs. Which is you have a lyricist who will be on the main beat, and then someone comes in and goes, like, every time that you hear someone go like, Da da, da 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 yeah yeah or do an ad lib that shoots in and is counterpointing that that's james brown that's james brown making that completely mainstream and making that a whole vibe and the man's influence can't be understated um and he was also a shitty ass human being in so many ways but 
uh, there's potentially reasons for that that we can get into in looking at the story of James Brown. So I'm going to stop because, again, I told you I could do three hours on James Brown uh, and I wouldn't even be doing it justice. So let's get into you've got this. Me, you've got me even more excited now. You're, that you're was, so that passionate. Was amazing. Yeah. You're so passionate, Christian, <laughs> that your camera can't even focus oh, I know, I know. on I'm your so, passion. I'm so sorry. I figured it would be fine because I was in this view. Oh, did I bring it back? Oh, oh, did I bring I it back? You're good. There we go. There we go. So, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and, and like I understood all these things, and it, it's because of great musicians that – understood this that brought it to me i did not realize this on my own this was brought to me by people who understand music a lot better than me um thank you evan appreciate it introducing me to james brown and funky town uh so uh let's get it so i am biased let, let me just say this like ahead of, ahead of what everything i'm gonna say understand i'm very biased about things that express this very well in film or okay in film and it automatically the mat source material is already like exactly my jam and I like it a little more than I like baseball. <laughs> so with all that being said, let's get into our non-spoiler thoughts of uh, Get On Up. Uh, Chris, let's start with you. What'd you think of Get On Up? I had a blast with this movie. Like I've mentioned, uh, I guess during our weekly upload, watching this back-to-back -back with 42 makes you realize how diverse uh, biopics can be. Like I said, 42 is a very linear, by the books, American movie. You know, it's a very straightforward cinema. But Get On Up uh, is very stylized. We have characters breaking the fourth wall. It jumps back and forth between times. We have title cards delineating the chapters within the film. And I feel like the, the way that the movie was made uh, really suits kind of uh, the nature of who James Brown was as a person, which I really like. You know, uh, there's a cohesion to the film uh, and to his character that I really appreciate. Chadwick Boseman in this movie is amazing. Uh, the, the first time you see him come out on stage to perform as James Brown, uh, I was watching the movie by myself and I said out loud, I couldn't help myself. I was just like, oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> he just completely embodies him as a person and i th there were points in time where i was like it cannot be chadwick boseman dancing like i was actively watching for for cuts to kind of hide like maybe like a dance double and it is 100 him which is crazy he's also nailing like james brown's inflections so when i talk when when we talk about like an actor fully embodying someone i think this is like one of the best examples of that um because you just Chadwick Boseman disappears and you you think you feel like you're watching James Brown so yeah uh this movie was hugely enjoyable to watch I actually ended up going back and re-watching some scenes before the podcast just because I wanted to watch them again um but yeah it, it's a blast I, I really liked it uh Chris you bring up so many good points I can't even like hang on to each of them but to give you an idea, uh, my fiance is very familiar with what Chadwick Boseman looks like. We've watched Black Panther. Uh, she watched some of 42 with me. And she didn't watch this film directly. Uh, she was busy, and I was watching with headphones on for this podcast to get it done, and she had stuff to do. But she saw it and was asking questions. And I said, I kept saying, she goes, I thought you were doing a Chadwick Boseman month. And I was like, no, that's Chadwick. Wow. We are doing Chadwick she goes, Boseman no, month. that's, she goes, no, no, no. Like, who is, she's like, and then she got confused of who Chadwick, she's like, no, I thought Chadwick Boseman looked like, that like Chadwick Boseman looks like this, and I'm like, no, that's he's got like pr prosthetics. She's like, is it CG'd? Mm -hmm. It's his fit. Like she, she's like, is it computer generated? And I was like, no, no, that's chat. No, no, it's like prosthetics and stuff. And like literally was like, no, that's not what that person is. And I'm like, no, that's it. <laughs> it's truly amazing. And then onto really the is. you know just to make a point onto the voice uh, because always with these biopics, and this is a a digression. So sorry if I'm derailing, but. With biopic music biopics in general, uh, you've got to like figure out what you're going to do with the voice. You have you have three options or a mix thereof. You either uh, you either have an actor in the case of Walk Hard, just do his best karaoke of that, and the amount of time he gets to train, his natural ability, how well he's able to do the impression. You know your movie lives or dies on that. Two. You just use source material uh, of that. Or three, you have another actor or another, you have a professional singer 
sing it so it's different, but the lips are dubbed. Right. For, for my money, number three, never the way to go. I never like that because you always lose something, right? It's either the actor's not doing that great of a job, but the voice singer's really great, so you don't believe that transition, and you can hear the difference in the voice, at least for me. It's hypercritical, speaking hypercritically of people's voices and music and stuff. One, you know, you get, you get, um, you, you, you preserve the artist's integrity, but you also get some of the problems with three, but you never are too judgmental because it just sounds like the artists we're talking about. Or two, yeah, you live or die on what, how good that is. And realistically, if you're doing it about a famous musician, you're really never able to get to that high, even in the case of Johnny Cash. E that's way easier music to do, in my opinion, than James Brown as far as vocally, um, vocally uh, embodying that. And uh, it's still, you're missing something. You're missing the zhuzh of the original artist. He was a le legend. Th that person was a legend for a reason. This movie decides to take a decidedly interesting, which is most of it is recorded footage, but some of it is Chadwick Boseman, but it just sounds like it's all original. And I, I, I honestly am totally fine with it because I thought it was a hundred percent original because I'm like, that's James Brown immediately because a lot of it is but some of it is chadwick boseman some of it wow. is it's impressive and i didn't even believe it i didn't believe it until i watched an interview with chad boseman he goes yeah some of it's me he's like i'm in there because we had an ad lib and some of the recordings are like messed up and some of the live ones aren't pristine so i'm in there and i have to do a little bit of the, the ad libs fill in for some of the stuff and uh the interviewer for one of them uh, that i was watching goes like we'll sing something and he's like don't do james brown you don't have to do james just do anything you want chad boseman sings he has a great voice. <laughs> what? Okay, wow. What? That's awesome. The man can also sing. Now, obviously, he probably couldn't have carried all of James Brown because that is there's a lot going on there. I mean, the man was yeah, of course. basically soul singer, R&B, and then whatever the fuck James Brown is always doing. Uh, but the fact that <laughs> it just sounds like the, the, the original artist throughout, and there's not even a question of like, oh, he's lip syncing and it's throughout, and then hearing that he does ad libs and not being able to detect him, I'll take it. Pretty great. Pretty great stuff. Uh, that's just a little bit on how they did the, the vocals and stuff. But uh, yeah, the amount of preparation that Chadwick Boseman had to do to perform this role, I can't even imagine how much time and effort and work he put into this. Yeah. That ain't the, uh, what, what, what's the movie does? That ain't the milkshake. What is it called? I think it's called the milkshake. I don't know. When, when uh, the dance, the, Jew, the classic Jewish. The mashed potato. Producer. The mashed potato. Oh, it's a mashed potato. That ain't no mashed potato. Uh, <laughs> you'd call it out if it wasn't good, for sure. Uh, Brian, what were your th overall thoughts on uh, Get On Up? So I'll just second. You guys have, have said it all. I mean, uh, it's it's truly transformative. The voice, the mannerisms, the dancing. Uh, I didn't even realize. I hadn't realized that he sang some of it, too. But it's mind-blowing. The performance is just incredible. Um Chris, to your point about this being a very different movie um, aesthetically and tone-wise than 42, the way this movie starts just leans into this batshit insane tone. And it's just like it's as eccentric as James Brown himself. Yeah, And I love that. It, it fits so perfectly and shows who he is, even though this movie may add um, – it embellishes a bit more than something like 42, even though most of the stuff did happen in, in part. But I think what this movie excels at is showing how complicated people are. You know, it feels like we are getting the good and the bad of James Brown, even though it's probably the bad is not as bad as it could have been. Christian, you talked about other relationships that um, he involved in with, um, um, spousal abuse and things like this. Obviously the drug drug use is there, but I think it shows him growing up and how much the mindset that was drilled into him because of the trauma and the family issues that he had growing up, um, how he carried that through into becoming a star and building walls up around him and losing the people that he loves because of so much that he's built up around him. And because of that, it really feels like a fully fleshed out character, even though it starts off almost caricature-ish, it felt like. But then you look and it's like, like the scene that starts off the movie did actually happen. With, <laughs> and I didn't know about, um, you know, the not, kind of- Not to like that extent, but- We might be talking about different scenes. I'm Maybe. not sure. 
but um there's a scene where he's it's in the 80s and he's got a shotgun that, um yes okay we are talking so, about different scenes okay yeah, okay that, so that one did of the apparently scenes. happen um but yeah so uh because of this i think it's a more emotionally affecting movie than than something like a 42 i know we're not comparison here but or we're comparing the two movies but i was i was really um i was hitting the, the emotional feels with this movie um and i think giving that kind of showing us both sides of who he was i think allows me personally to get a little bit more invested in the emotional stuff around around the character but yeah i think the performance here um he overshadows everyone around him but i don't think there's particularly bad performances christian may disagree with this but uh the music it's just like this movie is over two hours long but it moves and you're constantly going through new versions uh he's he's constantly re um recreating himself and pushing boundaries and pushing musical things and he's just so much fun to watch um i thought as far as biopics go this was a ridiculously fun movie even though um it's got some some difficult stuff obviously um the realities of racism are shown here in a way that um we don't get in in other movies necessarily but it's also not about that either so i think it toes the line and shows a really wide scope of time um, and I'm sure it doesn't get into the, the true depth of, of the career, but does a pretty good job of covering, you know, 40, 40 years of, of his life. Yeah, I think you point to the inherent challenge of making a film like this, which is just that uh, man was uh, prolific for so long and we're, we're reducing it to two hours. This is such a monumental task. And I was really scared when we started because it, it does start with literally the joke of uh, Dewey Cox and that's always the pitfall for especially music biopics which is which is Dewey Cox has to think about his entire life before he goes on stage it's literally that uh, scene it's James Brown walking yes, up yes. to a performance shortly before yeah uh, you know he passes right so uh, I immediately was like oh no oh no oh no I do not want to watch uh, Ray walk the line you name it again. I, I just queen Bohemian Rhapsody is what it was called. I, I just don't have time. I don't have to have the capacity to get through two hours of that. And uh, the movie zigs when normal movies zag <laughs> and goes then completely to the end of his, his life where he's like high on PCP and or high on crack or whatever the hell he was doing. And, uh, and immediately is like, this is going to be different and it's manic. And I can imagine again, to the comparison of Kanye West, Whatever movie we're gonna see a Kanye West biopic, it's happening. It's, we don't have a choice in the matter. It's just what's gonna happen. <laughs> and I imagine it's gonna be like this, but a little crazier. But this is kind of the structure in which you'd probably tell that story, because it is a similar artist. It's very probably uh, you know, traumatic uh, childhood, uh, very very just raw talent and raw hard work, and um, the problems that come with like race and business and show business and kind of the dynamics that play between that very similar story. I think that we would see to Kanye West. So I think it's a very apt uh, comparison. Uh, and Chadwick Boseman, as you've said, can't, can't be understated. It's just selling everything so well. And it, again, shadows it to the point where, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to shout this out. I know you guys may disagree from what we talked about before the show. He makes Dan Aykroyd look like a putz. I mean, seeing him, it seems Dan Aykroyd act between Chadwick Boseman, I mean, it's 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 a joke. It's literally a joke. He feels like a cartoon character in this entire thing to me. Uh, it, it's, it's, it feels silly. It feels silly watching Dan Aykroyd, and honestly, he's the worst part of the entire movie. See, uh, this is so interesting, Christian, because I feel like Dan Aykroyd is maybe not on the same level, but he's doing a big thing similar to um, – what Harrison Ford is doing in 42. Like he's kind Absolutely. of a big, big role father figure to this character. But, but to me, the opposite to where he's failing at every turn. Whereas Harrison Ford, he has me. But this is the James Brown movie. This, this where I think this movie, I'd rather focus on him even. Okay. Uh, I don't think this is spoilers. There's a scene between the two of them yeah. where uh, James Brown is selling him on a new way to market his shows, to promote his shows. To promote This them. scene is exaggerated in terms of i think it was more of a collaborative process than the scene would um recommend but he, 
I think he's the perfect playoff of that because Dan, we get Dan Aykroyd just continuing to talk and uh, Bozeman just walks away and just breaks down the music industry for us. And it's such a nice counterpoint where it's like Bozeman's breaking the fourth wall. He's breaking it down for us. Yes. And I think there's still, um, there's still like an emotionally decent relationship between them. You know, I think uh, where, where they finally go, like this someone is someone who has been with him for a long time and showed him the business of music after little Richard, which is another thing we'll, we'll bring up later that I think is really good. But um, yeah, I, I liked that he was kind of goofy. I thought it fit the tone of the movie and kind of um, gave a, a podium to James Brown, even if it was kind of hagi- hagiographical more towards James Brown than um, I, I can't remember the character's name. He calls him pop. But um, his name is Bert or uh, ben Bart, Bart, Ben Bart, Ben, right? ben Bart. Yeah, Ben, ben Bart. Bart. But um, yeah, I, I can't argue that Bozeman is, you know, just destroying everyone in terms of Dance acting around circles, him. Right. But the tone no, of the right. movie, I think if, I think he fits in it. I, I, you know, I agree. I'm glad that Ben Bart is in this film a lot less than uh, Harrison Ford's character <laughs> in 42. We agree on that. Uh, it's it, 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 it almost. You think God loves the funk. It, oh, my gosh. <laughs> It almost took me out of it. I just think it's just not landing. Wow! With wow! Kids. That's wild. Maybe, maybe I'm just a, a a Dan Aykroyd fan. Yeah, but it I didn't take me out of it at all. You know, I mean, Dan Dan Aykroyd doesn't have like huge range when it comes to acting. Acting, he's usually kind of just playing Dan Aykroyd in a way. But uh, they're usually roles that like suit his acting style, and I, I feel like Ben Bart was was suitable for what he's capable of doing. So I didn't, I didn't here's take the, issue with it at all. I guess here's the problem. Uh, I think the relationship between them is, is sweet. You know, like Brian said, it's like a, like a, he's a father figure to James Brown. I think the emotional stuff still works. And I, I, and I, I love, I actually will go on record and say, I kind of love this movie. It kind of like, it made me love. Nothing wrong with that. It made me love music again. Uh, <laughs> it's uh it's it's good. It's a really good movie, and I don't think Dan Aykroyd ruins it in any way. Uh, I'm being very harsh, but what I will say is like, I'm like Viola da- Davis is selling some really hard stuff to do in a script that is really trying to cover a lot, and I think I think she's pulling a lot of weight and stuff that isn't working as well, but she's holding it up. Mm-hmm. Dan Aykroyd in some of these scenes was the thing where I was like, oh yeah, movie. Uh, and I just like it kind of like just abruptly brushed it off. So I'm just not. Yeah, that's fair. I'm just not a fan of his acting in this movie, but he's 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 fine. <laughs> yes, he's fine. <laughs> I, I, I would think actually I'd is say hard. acting is hard. I would say he's actively bad in this movie, but that that is all taste. You you, you actively bad. You I both, disagree you both with liked that. Him. I'm glad he died. Not Ben Bard, but. Dan Aykroyd. Um, no. I'm Dan Aykroyd's done. still Dan alive. Dan Aykroyd is alive, bro. No, ben Bart dies. I'm not glad Ben Bart. I'm glad that his character. Like, You're mixing you your news? words there. No, what I'm saying. No, I, did, I wasn't saying. No, I would never say. You think I'm that bad that I'd be like, I'm glad Dan Aykroyd's you said, dead. <laughs> you literally said, I'm glad that he died. Not Ben Bart, Dan Aykroyd. Yeah, what I'm saying is because Ben Bart dies in, in real life. Like, in the movie. In the no, movie. In, in real life. Well, yes, that too. Exactly. Spoiler. What I was saying Spoiler. was, historically, I'm not glad that he died. I'm glad that the character that... That's what I was saying. Anyway. We you're saying you're so glad the character... What, point, a, a better way to phrase that would be, I'm glad the character isn't in the entire movie than saying you're glad that somebody died. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. You're, you're right. Welcome. I'm glad Dan Aykroyd stepped out of the picture uh, halfway through. And there the rest you go. of the movie was better for it. It, sound, it sounded like, um, too, because I think... Um, their relationship is downplayed or not as um, it's not as heavily shown as other stuff in the movie. This, the screenplay is obviously written to not highlight that. But from what I was reading, their relationship was even closer than even more of like a father son dynamic, even though later in his career, they kind of had a falling out um, as he did with most people who he worked with throughout time. But yeah, I think they did downplay it. And to your point, Christian, yeah, it's not the strongest emotional stuff in the movie by any by any stretch. I feel like we're in spoilers, Chris. You gotta edit us. We got part. there. I Unfortunately, I I'm sorry. Like, yeah, we'll we'll put a uh, Chris. I'll send you the. You should have the spoiler music. You gotta put it. I in. do because yeah. I, I I said he died. I'm so sorry. That was bad. It's hard with these biopics, right? It's no, like, of course. 
Uh, but uh, especially anyway, ones that go back and forth in time. <laughs> To summate my, I know we got in a big Dan Aykroyd uh, tangent there, but to summate my feelings, like uh, you're just harsh on the actors tonight. I don't know what it is. You're, you're I wasn't harsh. I was actually defending Chris Pratt for being fine. You were, you were trying to, but it didn't come across that way. Let us know in the comments if. Uh, well, this was in the week. What of Christian this is, all, Chris this is a mess. We're we're, we're <laughs> making a mess here of our show, uh, which is all my fault because I keep going on tangents. So, in summation of this movie, it uh, it's it's it's. I think it's excellent, and it's a great music biopic. In a, I don't love Walk the Line, and I love Walking Phoenix, and I love Johnny Cash. Probably, probably more just culturally. I like Johnny Cash more than than James Brown. Just as like, I connect with him. He's a folk singer, and he tells stories, you know. And it's less about the musicality; it adds to it, but it's really about uh, telling stories and expressing emotions and whatever. I just, I just like myself growing up. Johnny Cash was a bigger part of my life than James Brown. I like this movie more than Walk the Line, ten out of ten times. Uh, not that that movie's just bad. It's just this movie to me is like it has so much more going for it. I love the supporting cast. It's an excellent supporting cast, minus Dan Aykroyd. Um, but Viola Davis, uh, like uh, even especially Nelson Ellis as as uh, Bobby Bird. I yeah, think he's, he's just great. so good. Such good work. I love how this movie's edited. It just had me on the edge of my seat, just like where it was going, and then Chadwick Boseman, of course. It's it's uh, it's it's um, it's amazing, and it it literally made me appreciate funk again uh, in a way that I hadn't since I was like eighteen, and kind of reinvigorated the concepts of funk and how musically that works. And uh, we'll get into favorite. Well, I, I gotta stop rambling. We'll get into favorite moments, and I'll I'll go more into it. But I'm over the moon for this movie. It, it's one of my favorite movies I've seen in a while. It's 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 great. Since the Tomorrow War. I'm so happy you feel this way, Christian. And I also appreciate you, your musical knowledge bringing to it because there is a scene where they're talking about that thing about everything's a drum. And I couldn't help but think of Auntie Donna during the scene. And I was like, is this just a bit? What's going on here? But you breaking down how this is something a drum. that like- Everything's a drum. <laughs> I thought so. Are I didn't going, understand exactly what was. Are we what going he was into saying, favorite but... moments? Let's go, let's go into favorite moments. I'll lay mine. Right. And I'll let you. Yeah, I'll let you go run. Into I'll it. let yeah. you run. Go with for it. it. You're bringing up the moment in which uh, Craig Robinson, in one of the best scenes I've seen Craig Robinson in, as far as like a like a really straight acting thing. I think Craig Robinson is like I, I my opinion of him just went like up as like put this guy in a more serious role because I think he has it. Like he's stoic and he's playing the straight man to the craziness that is James Brown. Um, that that is that is a concept of music that I have o- always expressed, which is like, but are you feeling it right? And and this movie embodies it in a way that doesn't have to put it on the page; it just expresses it. Where he's explaining everything's a drum, he's rehearsing again, and Craig Robinson is like, I don't know why I have to rehearse again. Like he doesn't get it. He doesn't get James Brown. He doesn't get the vibe of the music. He's like, I'm just an excellent sax player, and it's like. I don't want to compare myself to James Brown. I'm not going to do that. I'm not even going to, actually, I'm not even going to step there. But there's a moment where he's going, does it sound good? Like, is it, because he's going, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it's not music theory. Like, you're, you're actually actively disobeying the laws of music theory. And he's just like, does it sound good? Then it's music. Can you hear it? Can you feel it? Then it's music. Like, and that's how you break boundaries in music is this moment of like, but, does it like is it conveying what we're trying to do more so than if we were like paying attention to the exact laws that you know the exact academia of music no because music's bigger than that you can understand it you can speak it in a common language that is music theory and is timing and meter and all this stuff but james brown is like no let's capture the groove and it's this disagreement of craig robinson going like no like is it hoity-toity like exceptionalist uh musician virtuoso going uh just not getting it not getting creative like the thing that makes music the beautiful thing that it is is one of my favorite scenes love it to death it's so good uh what are some other stand-up moments for you guys i have two uh and they they both kind of take place at the the front of the movie but brian you were talking about how the opening of the film kind of informs you as to what type of person james brown is right away and i agree with you but one scene that i like more than that scene is the one that i was alluding to earlier that maybe is a tad fictionalized and that is when he was uh james brown was sent over to vietnam to perform for the troops 
And he, so you're going to say, well, I, I believe he requested to go, right? It's he did. It was, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So this was uh, my first uh, memorable moment as well, by the way. So appreciate it. I love their it. planes <laughs> attacked when they're flying to the base and James Brown in that moment and Chadwick Boseman is just exuding this like eccentric confidence despite him being in the middle of a war zone. He's so certain that there's no way that he's going to die in this moment where the rest of his ensemble is just like praying to God that nothing happens, but he's having this excellent conversation with the pilot as he's trying to like dodge and weave between like mortar shells. Right. Where he's like, uh, he talks, this is a story that he comes back to constantly in that he was stillborn, uh, but uh, his aunt ended up breathing life into him. So this, in a way, kind of defines who he is as a person and that he feels like he's destined for something, right? He was born dead, but brought back to life. And he's, I'm going to butcher the line, but he, there's a great moment where he's like, you know, God didn't take me then. He's not taking me back now. You know, he's just, it, it, he's just so much confidence. And uh, that scene shows you exactly what you're in for for the rest of the movie. And I absolutely love it. Like he get he, he, they land, they unload everything. He gets onto stage and he basically boils down to what they just went through to plain troubles. That's what he tells the audience. And it, it just, yeah, yeah. It, it illustrates so well what type of person he's crazy. He's like, maybe <laughs> crazy is not the right word, but he is certainly confident and eccentric. And uh, I, I love it. I love that scene. The reason that scene works course, so well in the movie too is that it didn't happen, right? It didn't happen like that. Like he went overseas to Vietnam, but it, this whole exploding plane thing. It was during a, right. a dangerous part of the war, but they weren't actively under fire. Like but, the movie, right. but the reason it works, especially early in the film, especially throwing it on early, is because yes. it's exciting, right? It adds drama and conflict. But it's that you know that if that happened to James Brown, that is 100% how it would have played out. You talking about the set list? <laughs> what I'm saying <laughs> While they're is going that, down. Yeah. that the movie decides to take this a little like exaggerated approach to like, because again, a movie is having to sum up 40 years to like explain who James Brown is. That's the goal of the movie. And it's not like we're going to get 40 years of James Brown because that would take up our entire lifetime. It has to <laughs> summate it. But it shows us an extreme example that didn't actually happen, but accurately tells us there's not a doubt in my mind that even though that didn't happen, if it did happen, that's how it would play out with James Brown. True to the yeah. character. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I think it, it, it immediately shows us how, even though his music wasn't always necessarily political, how he was always kind of politically minded and dipping his toe into um, affecting the culture, in this case, you know, um, showing out for black troops, which were underrepresented in terms of who they had brought over to perform for them and stuff. So, um, yeah, totally agree, though, Christian. Yeah. What are some more of our favorite moments? The last moment that I'll mention is one that I mentioned earlier, which is the first time we see Chadwick Boseman come out on stage to perform as James Brown. And just it, like like I said, I was by myself watching the movie and I literally spoke out loud oh wow because i was just so taken aback at the performance i couldn't believe what i was watching he again he just so fully embodies this person i could not believe it yeah the the, the whole scene that that comes before with him saying like he you know doesn't want to go on before the rolling stones and he wants to close the show out and, and all that stuff like i don't know it's just such an excellent performance the, the welcome to America bit made me think of yeah. Will Smith punching the alien in the face and saying, <laughs> welcome to Earth. Welcome to Earth. It's like similar, similar vibe there. Also, yeah. fun. Mick Jagger. Said it. Mick Jagger, producer. This, I you know. Did. Yes. Yeah. Super awesome. <laughs> Appreciate that, Christian. Oh, yeah. You um, didn't think I noticed? I was. I watched the credits and I was like, Mick Jagger, produce. Oh, that explains. the. Rest. I was like, that's why the Rolling Stones are in this for a moment. <laughs> That makes sense. And he was totally self-deprecating. A lot of respect there. That's good. That was a good tip of the hat to, yeah. to a contemporary. Brian, some of your favorite moments. All right. So uh, after James Brown moves into the brothel with his aunt, when he goes to the church and sees the like ecstatic preacher and just how clearly just through this scene, showing everyone dancing, showing people speaking in tongues, showing how 
when you see him on stage, it's you can't not draw comparisons to this sort of ecstatic um, praise. And I thought it was just really well done, a very fun scene where we get to see some cool dance moves and um, maybe exaggerated, but um, a cool way to show like how the church was always fundamental to what he was doing and what he brought forward. Um, Little Richard, after he, that the scene is a little, ch a little changed in the movie. Apparently Little Richard allowed him to perform during the break in real life, but the conversation that they have afterwards where he's basically breaking down how to break into the music industry structurally yeah. and also talking about um, how the devil will be a white man and you have to, you know, be aware of this. I love um, how that comes back into play later in the movie as well. Like Dan Aykroyd says the exact words to him. He says, Excellent. don't like, I'm not the white devil though. Right. He's right. like, he, he gets defensive about it. Um, but yeah, but in no, the conference agree. room, he asks him, what do you want? You know, the exact, the exact thing uh, that little Richard said that the would suits ask. would end up asking. Uh, I'm not sure I caught that. Yeah. Also that's, a big that's shout out to catch. Brandon Michael Smith crushing it in the, you know, three minute, four minute scene. That oh he yeah. Has, as little Richard. Uh, very, oh, very good. oh, that's so good. Incredible. Yeah, no no doubt like you knew exactly who it was if you've ever seen and heard little richard like he, he nailed it um also got to realize what a ridiculous song tutti frutti is yeah <laughs> hey it's fun though it, you hear that you'll be dancing in the club it, for gets, sure. oh, yeah. it gets the people going it definitely <laughs> definitely does um i brought it up earlier but the scene where he's talking to pop about um changing how he markets his music where he walks away and walks into the the radio i loved all of that i thought that was really really fun and um interestingly shot um one of the some of the emotional stuff um when he goes to jail and we just see him in his cell repeating his name saying james brown james brown and just like so clearly fallen i feel like we don't get an incredible um his his drug use and how quickly he falls is maybe some of the more rushed stuff in it's the a movie glossed over yeah. we get his son dying and that being the ultimate potential cause in terms of the screenplay to why he fell into drug addiction because he really didn't even seem to party prior to his son um passing in the movie at least i'm not sure if that's that's true to, to real life but i thought it was tragic seeing him dressed up sweaty and just at his lowest in jail i thought that was really moving um and also when Bobby leaves and it's just the classic, he cannot tell him how much he loves him and needs him. He just cannot do it. And he turns and even as he's leaving, which I think they had a back and forth throughout the entirety of his career, but coming back around to the end scene, oh my God, when they, when they show up at the show and he's singing how much he loves them to him. And it's just like, uh, I'm getting, I'm getting choked up just thinking about it because it's so sweet. And it's just, you know, it's very much a movie moment, but I loved it. And to tie it into a song that they had sung together 30 years prior or whatever, it was just everything I'm looking for in this sort of story. No, those are all, those are all great. Uh, some key moments for me were the moment in which he thinks that there's someone coming, there's parole officers coming after him. They're touring and they're in the, and they're yeah, in there. Yeah. And the lady goes, who are you? You're nobodies. Right. And then uh, they show up and they're like, why, you know, they're like looking for him and they think a parole officer's coming. And then he says, no, I'm from Capitol records. And uh, they, he goes, Oh, well, we're for, you know, I'm James Brown, this flame lips or whatever, or flame, not flame lips, but the, the famous flames, flames. Famous, <laughs> flames. famous flames. Yeah. And uh she serves him the steak. I was just like, Ooh, that is a good moment. Movie. Boom. Super big. <laughs> awesome movie. Moment. And he just like turns to her and Chadwick Boseman's like, he just gives her that you. smile. <laughs> that super smug smile. It's so good. Uh, yeah. I mean, obviously the opening scene with the shotgun, it's just perfect tone setting for, for James Brown, uh, for the character. Uh, that he is i love the scene where they're which is actually based on a real like uh, thing that he did which like shows you how he was able to break into white culture as well which i think is also a parallel with uh with connie west but when he like stops and pauses and like goes and goes i'm at like a honky <laughs> <laughs> i'm in a honky hoedown <laughs> so it's not super clear this is actually a movie that he was in it's was a, yeah, it's a real guys? experience but yeah like i thought it was asked, a music video at first yeah. and then i read about it it's actually a movie that he was in yeah okay yeah, yeah. scene he was playing i mean it's clear that he's in like a some sort of production right because there's right everywhere. right uh that's super good 
uh, there was another one that I was thinking of. Uh, I oh, love he tears when... his pants at the end of it too. Oh yeah, and he goes, "My bare ass." <laughs> That's a good bit. My bare steak and potatoes. He, is it's like bass and drums or something bass, like bass that. Bass and, like and drums. Bass and drums. Bass and drums. <laughs> so good. Uh, that's it. Uh, obviously, like all the musical performances, like where he's dancing and like all the audio. I love uh, the scene. All, it didn't play it exactly like this, but it, like it just captures it so well. Um, when he the Boston scene where he plays in Boston, like that is such a tense scene with the dog barking. Yeah. And him having to like calm them down and like yeah. this place where he's stuck between his identity and uh, the culture and where it's at and what's happened and him being like listen, I'm playing a show, I'm going to get paid. And, like, obviously, uh, there's certain things that, like, I, I, I just want I just want everything to be fine and just me make my money. You know, that's kind of where, where he's able to do it, but he obviously de-escalates a really tense situation. It's just, like, a really tense, complicated kind of scene uh, that I think plays out really, really well. And, obviously, that goes into him singing I'm Black and I'm Proud. And that was cool, too, because I always loved that song, and that was always from when um, I got into James Brown when I was younger – seeing that come to life i actually because i'm not like a super fan of james brown i didn't see it coming that like i thought he was just reaching out and then when he actually starts doing the track i was like oh my god like it was like this moment of like holy shit like this is the this is the song and that was like a really nerdy biopic music biopic uh that that got me but yeah for that song when the band members are like you think he's gonna start fining the the kids the or kids. something <laughs> when he has the kids in the studio just silly, silly throwaway line. Yeah, there's like the comedy really works. There's a lot of comedy. I yeah. think it all all works and helps uh, elevate the tone, the overall tone of the film. Um, that moment- I gotta say too, before you get off of it, Christian, um, and we'll talk about it at the end of the month as well. But getting the moment where they hear about um, MLK being killed and that leads into that whole thing. Um, we also get a similar moment in *The Five Bloods* that I, I definitely want to talk about. Um, you know, and compare when when we get there, but um, definitely definitely solid stuff there yeah uh and then finally i'll say there's a moment where it's one of the darker moments of the film but i love it because it just comes out of nowhere obviously i don't all of the context of it but i just think it works really well in the film and not being shy about what a complicated figure that james brown was but that moment where he's santa claus right he's on he's he's just on the skyrocketing of success he's handing out the candies and that one dude looks at his current wife uh, in a crossway, like kind of like checks her out and stuff. And he knows he goes, Hey, back off, man. They go back in and he just like off camera smacks her and she hits the, I was like, I, I laughed actually during that scene. Cause like that, like that was the immediate like defense mechanism to how ridiculous it was. And then it like a nervous laugh, like a nervous laugh of like, Oh my God. And then like just the weight of the scene just happens. And you're like, Oh, Oh, all this like shit that he's been through is, is definitely. And he he comes back. Cause they go into the kitchen and we hear it. And then he comes out and looks at the camera and he's just so full of shame that yeah. it's it's hard to watch. It's, yeah. And that's when that like fourth wall breaking and the style of it, I think it was like working really well. And that was like a really yeah. like, grim reminder of like, because you're having fun with him, right? You're you're funking out throughout this film and you're like, you're in the groove and stuff. And then it just hits this like breaks of like, oh yeah, that's right. People suck sometimes. And like, uh, it's your to your point brian that like look of shame that he gives the camera like it, it just it re-illustrates this like cycle of abuse that that children go through like if their parents are abusive then they oftentimes will become abusive as well right and you can tell that in that moment he's like fuck i'm my dad exactly and you know? even so not only his parents but he was also um essentially forced into child fighting for yeah. and this is like a real thing apparently that happened um, forced to to fight as a child in in boxing rings, just completely brutal, insane shit. Um, and this is obviously not an excuse for anything, but I think it you know it shows how, you know, you have all this stuff that goes undealt with, and it expresses itself in in these sorts of ways. Yeah, and that leads into like, can. my final scene that like I really love, which is the th- that fight scene is so stark because of all the rich you know white affluent people around. And you've got the black jazz band playing. It's just it's so almost at its darkest. It's like they the the jazz band is just a different sort of performer that you know these people probably think of similarly, right? It's just like 
uh, but that, that was just... a tough scene to watch. And then he smiles at the end. They always turn the darkest moments into like, oh, but I flipped this, right? right. And exactly. it just which is, drove me. Which is exactly what he was doing, right? He found solace yeah. in that groove, in that in that Pentecostal Southern church, right? And that's kind of, that's why that scene works really well, Brian, you pointed it out, of like what he was doing, which was like, I will escape here. This is going to be my, my little white church. And uh, that, and that, that's why like, this works so much more than other music biopics, which is because it embraced. Because again, how are you going to tell forty years in a movie in this format? I just really think this is this magical, almost magical realism of everything with the stylistic choices, kind of Guy Ritchie esque ways they're expressing it, tells you more about the character than if you really tried to like let's get the most important moments and make them dramatic scenes, which is mm -hmm. when he gets he gets knocked down and. He sees that band and it transforms from that jazz into funk. And they're playing the horn section of Get On Up. As yes. he gets up, it's, come on. I just got chills. Yeah. Dude, this, this, that's this, cinema. That's cinema. That's that fucking is movies. That is fucking cinema. No, it's, it's, it's perfect. I, I don't know. I love this movie. I love it. I want to watch it again. It's a great movie. Uh, it really is. I was really blown away with that much. But I, again, bias for how much I love music. So that I think that definitely colors it because it's a very musical film. It's got a lot of James Brown. And I also like James Brown. So to your and point earlier, and though. It's, and it's got a great Chadwick Boseman performance. Unbelievable. Which yeah, is why everyone, we're here to begin with. Go watch this movie. You should buy it if you want to, but it is on Netflix. Like this movie's underseen, clearly. Like obviously it didn't make a lot of money. This movie should have made great money like obviously it's not um maybe the easiest watch at times you know it's not as straightforward a of a movie as 42 that kind of is more four quadrant maybe than than this movie but yeah uh definitely needs to be seen if you have any interest in james brown or bozeman underappreciated i think i just for sure heard as much as, as a movie like this should and it, it's like i think it's like problematic that like how is this not as big as walk the line i just don't get it Walk the Line was huge, made a ton of money, and uh, won a bunch of Oscars, uh, which is horseshit. <laughs> that movie's just okay. Acting is hard. <laughs> it's going to be the new phrase. That movie You're is spicy. So you are spicy that tonight. Movie is... <laughs> like widely acclaimed movie. She's like, this movie is fine. <laughs> that, that movie is okay. Like, it's, it's horse like, shit that it won the awards that it deserved. <laughs> it's literally a parody of itself at some point. Watch Dewey Cox. It just takes a dump all over Walk the Line. Well, I mean, I love Dewey Cox as well, so I'm not gonna. Have you seen that, Walk the Line but... recently? I gotta watch it. But I like in my memory, I was I, I thought it was okay when I saw it and when I was like, oh, it's pretty good. But I was like, it's I think it's just okay. Is it just okay? Um, we were we were relatively young when it came out. I, I feel like I'm not sure if I watched it all. I know I've seen some of it. Love that movie, and it made okay. Just they to do, compare, yeah. let's compare this. Let's compare this real quick. I'm sorry. Uh, no, 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 no. But this movie made like think about it. This movie made 33 million dollars, which is you know yeah. not bad. It made its money back. It probably, it, but it, well, probably not even right. It probably lost money ultimately what? with marketing. I just messed up the stream. No, no, no. I mean, it's really I funny. That... While you're looking this up, Chadwick Boseman, in an interview he did after this movie, was like actively like, I don't want to do um, another biopic after this. And I'm not sure if Marshall was immediately after, but um, it's funny that he did end up coming back to play another iconic <laughs> figure um, after this. Vamp. Okay. Is Walk the Line, made for a similar $28 million. How much did it gross? $120 million. $119,519,000. Brian. So close, you, Brian. You, you <laughs> <Wow>. clairvoyant. <laughs> you know, if my price is right, I would lose, though. So. In my opinion, <laughs> uh, this movie's better. It's certainly, it's, uh, it's, this country's racist. <laughs> that's all I'm gonna say. Well, that is that's a given. So. I think that's I, you know I didn't believe it before, but now I'm starting to think so. What? Oh my! Oh all right. boy! This okay. just puts the nail in the coffin. Uh, yeah, that's a shame. That's a shame. This movie's way better. I'm gonna say it. I'll check it out. Walk the line. It's on I'll, Netflix. I'll, I'll watch it. Walk the line. Yeah. Um, not that you should compare, but they. I mean, they're you know big influential musician. 
big performances, yeah. biopics. It's a shame. It is a damn shame. That is uh, Get On Up. Chris, what are we covering next week? Christian, next week, we're going to be watching not a biopic. We're going to be watching 21 Bridges. 21 Bridges. I haven't seen this one either. I kept saying revisiting Same. Chadwick. Boseman I have films. seen this one. Ooh, okay. All right. So Are any of them named it. Jeff? <laughs> All the bridges are named Jeff, Brian. Before we so get, sorry. before we uh, <laughs> wrap up, I actually want to get a like I want to get a pre twenty one bridges. Chris, you have not rewatched it yet, right? I have not. No, you saw it when? Uh, I saw it la- uh, last year when he passed. Okay. I went and watched it. Do you like it more than the two movies that we've covered so far? No. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like this but maybe upon rewatching, uh, things will change. Who knows? It's okay. From what I've learned, you don't get a bad performance out of Chad. No, you definitely don't. No bad with Chad. I will right. say that. I'll a Bose that. man, Nailed certainly it. not a no goes man. If you want to hear more from <laughs> whatever this is, please subscribe to the podcast. If you're on YouTube, follow in the about description. If you're on the podcast, follow in the uh, show notes. You will get a link to all our social media. Email us, popaholicscast, gmail.com. Rate us five stars on your favorite podcast player. Smash that subscribe and like button on YouTube. All the things that we do to be liked. Like us, like us, or don't. I don't give a shit. We do it for the stands. Am I right? That'll do it for this episode of Pop-